Ted, do you ever encourage people to reach out to you? Or you've got a Facebook page. We should promote that, right? Not your personal, but a business, yeah, sure. like business one. Yeah, no, I have a Facebook page and I have an Instagram. Okay, so and... we're gonna, at the end of the show, I want you to give out all the information. All right, so I'm now live. Hold on a second. I'm going to share it with some of my people. Hold on. Let me just do one thing. I'm going to make it public. Okay, now it's public. You should be able to share it now. Share to page or just share in general? Just share in general. Okay. One sec. Spinning wheel of death. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I think, think we're, we're good. I think I'm on. Ready to do this? All right, everybody. Nice. Good afternoon. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to the Drug and Alcohol Attorneys Facebook Live Show. I am super excited to be with you guys again. And, uh, well, sorry, Daryl Strawberry, but this might be my best looking guest ever. Tara oh, Connor, thank you. Yes, thank you. Tara Connor, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, on we the are. Computer. We are. <laughs> we're, su we're, we're, su we're super excited to have you. And I was really um, so flattered that you decided to join us. I know that you. You know, you spend a lot of time traveling and talking about what you do. So um, thank you for coming on the show and sharing, sharing some time with us from my other hometown of Los Angeles. Yeah, it's so hot. So I'm, hot. <laughs> yeah, so for all those people here in Florida with me that have been complaining about the heat, apparently it's even hotter in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. So I hear. I have a garden that I have to watch like a hawk because the temperatures are reaching like 102 and up. I live in the valley, so it's like. You have a garden? Terrible. Yes, I garden. I'm impressed. Mark, yes, I'm growing a lot of kale and tomatoes and green peppers and uh, other peppers. You know, we pre interview for half an hour. You never shared any of this stuff with me. What's up with that? I mean, you're not asking anything about my personal you know life. Fine. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that. Don't worry. Okay, so everyone, look, we're, we're great, to, great to have you here, Tara. So I always like to start from the beginning because, you know, people don't, they don't really know much about you, right? I mean, they probably saw the stuff with, you know, with, the, with uh, the Miss USA and Donald Trump, but they don't know about what, what humble, humble religious beginnings you come from. So tell us oh, a little yes. bit about that, because you're in LA right now, but you didn't grow up there. Tell us where you grew up. I grew up in Russell Springs, Kentucky. Um, it's, a, it's a small town, and uh, a church on every corner they recently became a wet county so while i lived there it was a dry county so they didn't sell alcohol and you know it's just one of those very traditional middle america home towns where everyone knows everything about everyone <laughs> and we're all a little judgy from there or we have been in the past and there's not a lot that you can get get by with so um i had a great reputation <laughs> okay all right we are gonna get personal i like that yeah okay um all right so so tell me about your home life i mean did you did you have a mom and dad in your life do you have siblings yeah yeah i have uh, i have a brother named josh he's 18 months older than me and he is brilliant and my mother is probably one of my best friends and one of the, the kindest people I know and giving. And I have an amazing dad who's very smart, business oriented, go, go, go. And, um, and I've learned a lot from him, but you know, every family has their moments of dysfunction. And I had a lot of mental illness in my family. I've watched people, you know, drink their faces off and, and just kind of be off their wits end and I've also watched you know my mom have to go through things where she's trying to keep a family together that just isn't working because we had mental illness from my brother and me and my dad and her even you know we all had some type of something so our little family unit was a beautiful unit but it was just there was a lot of sickness in it and so it was hard. It was very hard because I lived in a town where you um, save your face and, and you can't save your face and your ass at the same time. Well, so I want to know, who, who were you close with, your mom or your dad? I was closer to my mom when I was younger. 
Um, but now I'm, I'm, I'm close to both of them. Like I, it's a lot more fun to have a relationship with my parents as an adult than it was when I was a child, because let me tell you, if I had me for a child, I would have pulled my hair out. So I don't, <laughs> I, I can't, um, I can't knock them for anything because it's hard dealing with a kid with addiction and there's a lot of healing that has to happen with the family before you can just get to, Hey, how's your day? <laughs> So, so who was the stricter of the parents? Because I know in my family, my mom, who came, as I told you, who was raised in a very conservative, orthodox Jewish family, was definitely yeah. the, the stricter of the two. And yeah. my dad, was a, who wasn't, was a little bit more relaxed. So, My dad was the strict one. My okay. mom had all of the morals in the world. But she had a very hard time saying no to me. Because, I mean, I was very manipulative. And I think that, I feel like... My mom's idea was that she just needed to keep the peace, right? Just keep the peace in this family. And my dad's idea was I have to build this family. I have to build up my business and work and show everyone that we're worthy. And, and you know, it's a lot of keeping up with the Joneses. And so, uh, again, we weren't really, we, we didn't really talk to, you know, I'll just say this. Parents know, I mean, kids know when their parents are uncomfortable. So when my parents were divorcing, I could sense that there were certain things that I couldn't take to them. Like I couldn't tell them that I was having sex. I couldn't tell them that I was taking prescription drugs and I couldn't let them know when I was pain in pain and like cutting myself because I knew they couldn't handle it. Awesome. And every child is like that. Let's back up a second. Cause this is, this is some really good stuff. And it's sort of stuff that I'm sort of learning for the first time about you. So how old were your parents, how old were you when your parents got divorced? They got, they were uh, 14. I was 14. You were 14. Okay. So, so, so tell me what, what was life like, you know, a 14? Cause I know, you know, as when we're, we're young and silly, we, you know, and we drink and do silly stuff. I mean, I know I did and they're by the yeah. grace of God go I. So, I mean, like, what was a young tower like? Were you wild? Were you out of control? Were you, you know, yeah. chasing the guys and drinking and pot? I mean, what were you, what were you, I see, I see a smile on your face. That, come on. So tell us the truth here. Well, no, I wasn't even, <laughs> I, um, I think, well, 14 was a humdinger because that's kind of when everything started falling out of place, I guess you'd say. I, um, my grandfather, who was my best friend, passed away that year. My parents were divorcing. And, you know, so the, a lot of the attention was just on kind of them and trying to like, hey, I can move around this, you know. And I, um, I, I just started... I was drinking. I started drinking on a cheerleading trip because I, I was pretty awesome at cheerleading and <laughs> I was put on you the one that was doing the back flips off the guy, off the guy's shoulders. Yeah, I can do that. I can still flip. Still do it, huh? All right. I'm not oh, going to yeah. let you do it, but I am tempted, but I don't want to, you know, if, cause God, for, <laughs> God forbid you do it and something happens. I'll be on, I'll be on the front page of well, CNN. Listen, uh, I'm 32 years old. Things don't work the way they used to. I listen. I, I hear you. Well, I'm with you on that one. <laughs> but so, yeah, I, I had my first drink trying to fit in and trying to feel a part of because I definitely felt a little displaced in the world. And by the end of the year, I was, you know, here's the deal. When I found alcohol, I found my best friend because I was crazy and sorry. Okay. And, uh, I was very crazy and, um, I was suffering from mental illness and I had this like unmanageability about me before I ever put a drink or a drug inside of my body. So I would say that, um, I had a, an, a sickness of a spirit and an untreated mental illness that when I finally found something that worked for me, it really worked. You know, when I drank, I felt normal when I did cocaine, that was a little later, but I would take diet pills because I could focus more. And I, um, you know, obviously was trying to hang with a crowd. I was 14 in middle school, but my peers are seniors and juniors in high school. So I was mixed up with older guys and so, there so, go so, I. So tell us how you didn't, I mean, trying to maybe help us to understand a little because, you know, I mean, I'm sure you didn't just wake up one day and be beautiful. I'm sure you were always beautiful. You're on the cheerleading squad. I imagine you were popular. You were in a small town. So how does, how does Tara just feel like empty or like there's something missing. I mean, give us some insight as to what's going on. Cause you know, we know from the outside. I think it's different. My view of everything 
is my view, you know? So it's, um, it could be completely off base, but um, if any of my friends from high school are watching this, I just never felt a part of. I always felt different. Um, I, the boys didn't ask me out ever, ever. Ugh. So I dated older guys because, you know, that was easy. And I, um, I always felt like I had to compare myself to certain people and I was held to a very high standard because I did pageants and the truth was, was I was a normal kid and I, um, you know, I did my best to fit in, but sometimes that was by drinking and using. I mean, that's kind of how I found my crew. Okay. So I, I know I read about, I think actually, I think you talked about on the Ted video. And so for the, for the people who haven't, who don't know any about you, they, they really should go on YouTube and just Google your name. It's a great like 10 minute, 10 minute YouTube video of you at uh, doing the TED talks. And I got to tell you something, I really, as we sort of jokingly said before we came on, 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 on uh, live on Facebook that I wanted to send you to law school. I got to tell you that took some, as my Yiddish mother would say, chutzpah to get up there and talk in front of that crowd that took stones. And, um, but you, I think you do talk of there about the cheerleading thing and how you didn't feel like you fit in and all of a sudden you found alcohol and boom, you were like, yeah, I got yeah. it. I mean, listen, I was like, hey, I mean, there, listen, there's a reason why kids are drinking at 11 these days. The world hasn't gotten easier. <laughs> so, you know, and it's scary because I think a lot of people have an idea about addicts and alcoholics that they made a choice to be that way. But the truth is, is, you know, at 11 years old starting, I mean, I was 14 and I felt like that was early. The brain is so so stunted that you're so much more likely to become dependent because their little brains aren't working. And so mine wasn't developed enough to handle altering it with drugs and alcohol. And so I just kind of like lost it, but I was very good at losing it. I could always smile my way through it. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you, you're making me blush here. You know that? Um, Hi. Hey. Uh, so, you know, I always tell them to take a photo off of me to try and get my good side. You have two good sides, so you, it's easy for you, you know? Well, here's the thing. Like, I, I hate, listen, when the cameras decided to take a picture of the way that you see it and flip it like a mirror, like, no one needs that. No one, it changes everything. Everything. Like, anyway, that's my opinion on the flippy camera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let, let's, let's get back to, 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 to the whole drinking thing. So, so how did things progress? Because you, you you started to drink on this on this uh, this cheerleading, I guess. Uh, when you were you were, you were cheering in an away game, right? An away football game. Am I right about that? We were in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, on like a, a competition thing with a basketball team, okay. and you know the, there was it was during college spring break, I believe. So there were a lot of drinks around, and um, our cheerleading coach, you know, was asleep. So the girls poured some vodka and. And so I drank with them. That was my first drink because I was like, okay, yay. I'm like, I'm feeling included, whatever. And then, you know, it, uh, somehow prescription drugs got put in front of me. I started um, doing Percocet and Vicodin that same year. And I'm pretty sure I tried morphine that year. Um, it was just there. Like, it wasn't one of those things where... Um, it's how it progresses for anyone. It's like, oh, if one feels good, then how great is two going to feel? And then when you start building up a tolerance, things just don't work the way that they used to. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it didn't take long for my disease to, like, progress to doing opiates. So, so did anybody, any of your close friends, I mean, people not on the channel, sort of close friends or family know what was going on with you? I think that my parents knew that emotionally something was wrong with me, but I think that they never would have imagined that it was drugs because okay. they're my parents. I don't think any parent wants to see their kid and say, Oh my God, I think they have a drug problem. Like it doesn't even come into their mind. It's like schools these days. When you say that you're going to come speak to them about drugs and alcohol, they're like, we don't have that problem here, <laughs> but it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, it's absolutely yeah, everywhere. And and again, like when I was talking about earlier, there are certain things that kids know not to go to their parents with, because I mean, say you're watching TV, every, we've all experienced this with our family and then a sex scene comes on and they're like, oh, shut your eyes. Oh! And they try to like protect you from that. So we know, okay, I can't go to them with sex stuff because I don't need all that. <laughs> right. I think my parents so always put people I wanted to ask sex questions about. So, I mean, how comfortable can you be asking your mom and dad about that? Right. 
Right, and also there there was just so much going on with them that I kind of went into my own little world and my own little delusion and reality that I created for myself that um, it was pretty bleak. You know, I was, I, I mean, I was suicidal in a way of like, where I didn't have the balls to actually go through with it, but the thoughts were definitely there. When did the, when did um, that start? When did the thoughts start? That started before I started using. That's when I was a kid. Okay, and I, I mean, think that you, you also mentioned, different. yeah, you mentioned you were, were cutting. So tell me about that. When did that start and what, what that actually involved? I think that was around like 15, and I don't remember where I got the idea. I, I have no idea. I'm trying to remember the first time that I did it. Oh, it wasn't just cutting. It was by self-harm. Like, I remember one time I got so mad that I put a cigarette out on my arm just so that I could see where the pain was coming from. Does that make sense? It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I think people who self-harm, they do it because they can control the pain that they're going through physically when they can't get rid of the things that they're going through emotionally. So, you know, I would do it in um, simple ways. Never like, you know, I'm, I'm a very like pansy cutter. I don't have like major scars or anything, but I do have the cigarette burn. Like, I, I think I was just seeking for relief. Like I just needed relief from the hell that I was living in and I, I would do anything to get it. Wow. So, yeah. so we've got the backdrop of, of, of basically the beginnings of addiction and yet you're, you're also doing the beauty pageants. So when did you start doing the pageants? Um, I did a couple of baby pageants, but I was a brat. So my mom didn't want me to, you know, keep doing that. But I did um, my first like big pageant, which was Young Miss Russell County Fair. Very tough to win these county fairs. I'm not even kidding. It was harder to win Miss Russell County than it was to win Miss USA. I'm not <laughs> joking. And um, it must be a good you know, looking crowd in your neighborhood then. Huh? It must be a good looking crowd in your neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, we Kentucky breeds some pretty women, let me tell you. And, you know, it's kind of just what you do in the South. Like, think honey boo boo, but like less. Think honey boo boo with a little more Jesus. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have to think about that one, but okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, my mom was getting her hair cut and her friend Phil was like, you should put her in Young Miss Russell County Fair. And I, even though I was a cheerleader, I was always a tomboy. Like I was always in the creek catching crawdads and I would throw the ball with my dad and play basketball. And I loved four wheelers and going mudding. Like I was, uh, against it. But then when I put a dress on, like I felt pretty for a second and Somehow the first pageant where I just knew that I was going to lose and not even make top 10, I walked away to the winner. And, you know, I think that that's when the mask began for me because no one thinks that a pageant girl has problems. I think we all have these ideas about specific people that, you know, harm doesn't come their way or they are too good for certain things. And, um, you know, for me, it was just, it was a necessary evil and my mom definitely tried to push me towards that because she knew that I would be stuck in that town if I, and that was the way out. Was the way out. So how, how old were you when you did the first pageant? I was 14. Okay. So is that before or after the whole cheerleading uh, escapade? That was, um, I think before. No, it was after, after, after. Okay. So, so we, so is, is it fair to say that you were, you were using at the time, right? You sort of drinking, yeah. drinking. Oh sure okay all right okay that's a good one right okay so, yeah. so things are progressing tara's starting to do some of these uh the beauty contests um you're mm -hmm. on the cheerleading squad how you doing in school mm -hmm. you're a good student i was a straight a student until my it may have been my sophomore year i started slacking because it started to get a little out of control and i think it was my what do you mean by that when you say it's out of, it was out of control tell me what that um, was i was like skipping school and um i couldn't manage my emotions like i think when people hear out of control they think that you're just like raging and like breaking things and you know killing people 
<laughs> I, um, I, I was just out of control emotionally. You know, the unmanageability within me was so heavy that I always felt um, this, the deepest, darkest despair. It's like the, the worst, it's just grief. It's like I was grieving something as heavy as like a loss of my mother, which thank God she was still alive. But that, the feeling, I know it, like I experienced it. It's like living in a prison and not being able to find a way to get out of it. And so, you know, I tried to, with friends, trying to be cool. I was getting into fights. I, um, what do you think you were grieving? What do you think you were grieving, Tara? I don't know. Maybe like the loss of my innocence or my childhood. I have no idea. I, I think that, um, one of the things about mental health is people, and you know this, people will be like, if they say I'm depressed, people are like, but why? You have nothing to be depressed about. You know, I, I didn't have any reason. I just did. It's just one of those things where I couldn't control it because it was a part of my body. I mean, my parents tried to, I think I was put on like Paxil or Zoloft or something, but I didn't take it properly because I was a drug addict. And I, um, yeah, I started getting snippy, talking back to teachers, skipping class, um, going to detention. Uh, I think my freshman year, yes, my freshman year, I got popped drinking alcohol in detention, and they sent me to alternative school, which is where so, they sent so all you, of So you got in trouble in detention. What were you in detention for? Skipping class for a Spanish test. I wasn't ready for it, so I skipped. And they're like, you have detention. And then I found alcohol in someone's locker, and I was like, fine. <laughs> and so I got hammer smashed and, like, was puking in the principal's trash can while my mom shows up. And you know, they, they suspended me for, I don't know, like three days or something like that. And then I was put into the alternative school program, which is, you know, right beside the middle school. It's like alternative school, middle school, high school. They're all on the same street. And, you know, it's where the bad kids go. And, um, you know, I had to sit in a cubicle. There was level one, two, and three. You had to like work your way out of the system. And I was such a little asshole that I stayed there, I think for like, 12 weeks when I was only sentenced to like eight. So, so, so I, uh, I mean, when, when your mom saw what's going on, did she say to you or your father say to you, listen, Tara, what's going on here? Because this is, you know, it's, this isn't normal behavior. I mean, did they ask you, is there something going on? Do we need to talk? Um, obviously. I mean, uh, my parents definitely tried to figure out what the deal was. I still don't think that they, they knew that I had gotten hammer smashed, but I don't think that they knew that that was a regular occurrence. And also my, um, I was real, I was a great liar. Like I knew when to protect the, the kid that I had raised, right? But like this little, I call him, he's like a 12 year old boy named Eric and he's fat and he loves alcohol, drugs and donuts. Like I just feed, feed, feed. And I don't want anyone to take little Eric away from me. He lives inside of my stomach, but I, I protected my disease because it was my best friend. And so I wasn't going to. Made you fit, uh, made you fit in. It meant, well, yeah, it made me feel nothing or decent. That's what's so bad about opioids. It's like getting a warm hug from God. It's very easy to get addicted to something like that. Or maybe that, the devil. I, huh? Or maybe the devil. Whatever. It's, either Pick way, poison, it, right? was, uh, it wasn't good. It. I would have taken it. It didn't matter. <laughs> um, okay. I just know that. It was really hard on my mom because she spent a lot of time trying to protect me. And my dad, um, you know, was more of like a disciplinarian, but I also became very mouthy with him. Like I remember, I think when I was like 15, I punched him in the face and gave him black eye. And it's, you know, I was a little, I was a handful, but um, what do you do? I mean, how many parents out there, I mean, what would you do? What do you do with a kid like that? I, mean, I, would, I would think back then, I mean, your parents would just, they think, well, you know, she's drinking a drug and it's a, it's a disciplinary matter. And so we have to discipline her, right? I mean, it's only well, really yeah, recently I mean, since people like you have been talking about it. We even know what it is. Right. I didn't That's mean it. Throw them away. Yeah, I think that the disciplinary action was being grounded. You can't talk on the phone, like those types of things. But I mean, how do you discipline a kid who's like going out and drinking and, you know, doing sexual things and 
I mean, I real I, I don't think that they were prepared for someone like me. And I don't really think a lot of parents are prepared for that. Um, but it also was kind of one of those things where, and I think I see this a lot in schools now, like parents would rather have their kid drink at home than go out and party like if, because they're at home, they're safe, they're not driving, right? So um, it became more about don't, it, uh, don't let people see you do it as opposed to don't do it. Does right. that make sense? It does. It does. So, so meanwhile, did you continue with the pageant thing, even though all this sort of craziness was going on yeah, in the background? I, mean, I, I kind of kept climbing up the system. I was a bit of an oddity, like in the Young Miss Kentucky thing, I, I ended up getting first runner up my first round and I um, started getting into uh, like Miss Kentucky, but I also did like Miss Kentucky Teen USA and like all of these uh state titles I kept winning them and then you know my sophomore year I went to Miss Teen USA which was in uh where was that Texas uh South Padre Island Texas and you know I was on television and people saw my face and all these things were happening and um yeah I just kind of kept going because it was it was like this thing that I was good at and it got me out of a lot of scrapes and it also I wanted to feel I, I separated myself from my peers because I felt like I would never be worthy of them did, did you feel like I there was like, did you feel like there was there was did you feel like there was two people like there's there's the Tara who's on stage right and then there's like party Tara like and they're two two separate people did you feel like you were living two lives because I mean, while, while you're on the stage, yeah. nobody knows what's going on in your head, right? They, they're not walking in your shoes. They're not part of your journey. I mean, only you can experience no, that. I mean, I put it to you this way. When I watch old videos of myself doing interviews, like I cringe because none of those answers are mine. They're my mom's. Because she would sit down with me and we would go over interview questions because listen, it's like, it's like applying for a big job and you got to be on top of your game. And I, I just... I think that my depression really helped me when it came to pageantry because I didn't care. And when you don't care about something, you can kind of float through it and you don't have that desperation and it comes across as confidence. And um, yeah, it just served me until it didn't. You know, I didn't expect to win Miss USA at 20 years old. I expected to get like second runner up and, you know, get married and have babies and just do the whole thing again. Okay, so, so so help me understand just a little bit. So, I mean, when you did the shows, did you feel like you got a, just sort of got a, a sort of an endorphin rush? Did you enjoy the attention? I mean, how did you feel about that? I mean, because I know when I'm in the courtroom, okay, and I'm in front of a jury, that is such an endorphin rush for me. I just get such yeah. such a rush from it. And then afterwards, you come, oh, my crash. Yeah, okay. but you're on top of your game. And there is right. a crash. You're in the zone. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I would win the pageants, that would definitely feel good. The, the biggest rush that I ever had was winning Miss USA because that's like scratching off a lottery ticket. You have a better chance of being drafted into the NFL than becoming Miss USA. And I never thought that it would be me that would do that, right? So uh, yeah, it felt great, but it was terrible for my ego because it just fueled that idea that I was better than, I don't need that. I'll show you all of that. Because I felt like if I was superior to everyone, then they couldn't hurt me. So I was either like, you know, um, fungi, like just growing like bacteria, whatever, or I was like a queen. It, there wasn't an in-between. <laughs> That's what it was. And ultimately I pushed everyone away. Wow. So, so it's that your mom. I mean, so now, meanwhile, so obviously, I mean, I'm at this point, you're, you're, I mean, you're in full blown addiction. Is that fair to say at this point when Missy oh, yeah. runs around? So, oh, yeah. so, 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 so do your friends, do your close friends know what's going on? Do they know there's, you know, the, the, the... Um, I think, this is a gypsy, sorry. <laughs> um, I uh, think, yeah, my close friends knew that I was using, but they were also using, you know, right. I don't think anyone was, uh oh. You better be careful. Even. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it was just, uh, I was like, oh, cool. Like, I can't wait to come home and like, we'll celebrate by crushing up pills and snorting them. Like, it just seemed very normal to me. 
it's like the big book says my alcoholic life seemed the only normal one. Like that's, that's how I felt. It was wow. normal. So, I didn't realize that it was that normal. So, so you get to the Miss USA show. I mean, I don't know that much about it, but I'm thinking this like when I was a kid growing up, they used to have the Miss World competition. It was owned by an English mm -hmm. guy, a bit like Donald Trump. And they would do like rounds, like, you know, swimsuit, you know, yeah. the whole bit, you know, answering oh, questions. Yeah. So, so how long, how many, how long does the show, I mean, how long, how many days does this thing take? Well, you get there about two weeks early or two and a half weeks early because it's a live telecast and it's a big production, right? At the time it was on NBC and it's live. So you have to have everything on point. Every girl needs to know what to do if she gets called into the top 10. Where do you stand? If you make it to the top five, where do you stand? So during the evening times when we weren't rehearsing for hours, we would go to like restaurants and have press events and look pretty and and everyone had their eyelashes on all the time like it was exhausting but yeah it, it takes forever and it's all building up to this final moment when you know we go live on NBC and we see okay well who's gonna make it who's making it right and then I just kept progressing it was quite a rush so so are you are you using through the through the through the whole that whole two weeks I convinced um, someone's dentist that I had a rotten tooth, and so I had pills shipped to me. And I think someone gave me a Xanax right before the show started, and I, I think I was like, oh, I have five hours. It'll wear off by then. So I was high as a kite when I won Miss USA. Wow. That's, uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's amazing. It's, it really is. So, um, so, so, so during the show, like when, when's the first time you get to meet Donald Trump? Oh, um, actually, I, I got to be on, hang on, I'm going to switch over to, I'm on, I'm on two different views here. Let me switch to Yeah, this don't, one. don't look at the Facebook one because it's a little bit time delayed. It will completely mess you up. I, I look at you through the Zoom, the Zoom one. Otherwise, you're going to be, you're going to be hearing uh, me, but seeing a delay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was just, uh, <laughs> I saw that there were like comments and stuff. I was like, whoa. Anyway, I think I'm coming back to you now. No, where did you go? Wait, I'll find you. You relax. Don't even worry about it. Uh oh. Uh oh. Me. I'll find you. Give me one second. Just move that. Uh huh. Uh huh. There you are. You got me? All right. We're back in back the game. So you meet Donald Trump. Tell, tell me about it. When, did you, when was the first time you meet Donald Trump? I think the first time we met him, we, I was in Baltimore, Maryland when I was competing and we drove, we all went to New York for like this event for Trump and, you know, we all got to shake his hand and meet him and, ah, and, um, you know, one of the rules at, at the time was Trump got to, you know, kind of handpick people that he liked. And so there was a lot of like, it was, uh, you know, looking back, that sounds terrible, but you know, it was all about, ah, look at me, I'm here. And so he was very nice, but it, you know, I think anyone that meets Trump is he's nice to them because he likes people to like him. And so he, uh, he was kind, you know, as far as he wasn't a jerk, <laughs> but, um, I think when I really got to know him was after I won Miss USA, we were like taking pictures together. And then after I moved to New York, I went to his office and that's when we first like sat down and talked about, you know, life, love and the pursuit of happiness. Okay. Not the love part, but the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> okay. So, so you, so you win the competition, right? And mm -hmm. so like, what is life like for you after you win the competition? Cause I mean, it doesn't get, I mean, the beauty pageant world, that's about as good as it gets, right? I mean, it was, it was a change because, you know, I grew up in a town at the time it had two stoplights. It's got more now. Um, <laughs> but I moved to New York city. I didn't know what a cross street was. I'd never had sushi or Starbucks. Um, I didn't know how to hail a cab. Uh, I didn't know north, south, east, west. Like I never had to worry about directions. It's always like, Oh, it's about five miles up the Cumberland Parkway. You know, I was very, uh, naive. And, and so, but what I knew was, was I started making, 
I had these ideas. Like I, I remember when my dad like got his first big raise it was, and it was a specific amount of money. And I was like, man, I can't wait till I make that amount. And it was exactly the amount that he made when he felt good about himself, you know? And, and I had people dressing me and I had people playing with my hair and, and, uh, um it was great like I was walking the red carpet with people that I was like whoa but at the same time I was like I'm supposed to be here and then when I would go home at night I'm like why am I here <laughs> like it was never it was never consistent um so you, so you, you, won, you won the competition and it's there's still like the two towers right there's the one that's like on the red carpet I'm supposed to be here and then you go home and it's almost like oh, this well, is I it wouldn't go home. Well, to back to your apartment. Oh, okay, the bar. Okay, <laughs> but at some point you, you got back to your apartment. I guess it was in Trump Plaza or wherever it was, and you had this all, almost like a letdown. Is that what you know what it felt like? I mean, you went from the high and then you would go home and just sort of crash. Um, it was up and down. I mean, I think that people believe that being Miss USA is kind of just like this glamorous life, but the truth is, is you know, every night before you go to bed, you get a fax, kind of like Charlie's Angels, and you have uh, nineteen people that are. It's this organization that controls every single move that you make, including when you wake up in the morning, when you can go out, when you can't, when you go to the gym. And so, you know, it would usually start like 6, 7 a.m., be here, do this. Then after that, you're going to go here. Then you're going to go volunteer at Gilda's Club. And then you're going to go to God's uh, Love We Deliver. And now you got to go fly out to, you know, Oklahoma. And then you're going to fly out to Florida. And then, you know, it's, um, I wasn't prepared for that job because it's a job and I, I had to like speak and I was being, um, my, my accent was really heavy at the time. And I was, you know, a, a little, uh, stunted in the, the grammar area. And I said things the wrong way and they were sure to let me know that I said things the wrong way. So I never felt like I was enough again. Here I am. I get to this thing that I think is going to fix me, and all uh, all over again, I feel like I'm not enough. And uh, so it I was exhausting. I presume you're still you're using it this time, right? Yeah. I mean, I didn't really stop. I never okay. stopped. I stopped for like a year, I think, when I got busted the second time in high school with Percocet on me. Okay, so and I went back to alternative school. I went there twice. Oh, you were bad. You were bad. Yeah, I wasn't like you know that sweet little kid that everyone thought was bringing cookies to church. You probably were the one trying to burn the church down. I think maybe no. Huh? <laughs> you might have been the one trying I to burn the church down. Well, no, I, I, you know what's funny is I always knew that I was seeking something, and I had been seeking a relationship with God my entire life, and uh, you know I would see people. Um, you know, throw their hands in the air at church. So I would throw my hand in the air and then I would see people, you know, run to the front and bow because they're being, getting saved. And so I thought, well, if I just do it, then maybe Jesus will love me. And um, I, I definitely saw it and I definitely turned to um, to God and I had a, a, an interesting relationship with this God idea. And then, um, it, but it wasn't, it wasn't my ideal. It was the ideal that people around me had kind of impressed upon me. And a lot of that was, you know, be good. Don't lie. You know, don't drink, smoke, have premarital sex, do any of those things. And, you know, I was, I'm, a, I'm an abuse survivor. I was abused by an uncle when I was 14 years old. I read about and, that. And I know that was a big thing. Yeah. Terrible. When did you, when did you realize that? When did you realize you've been abused? When did you know that? Think. When you were old, you were 18. Okay, wow. Yeah, well, I thought I had suppressed it. It was like a memory that would pop up every now and then. And then I told like one of my friends about it when I was a kid. But I was like, I think it's just a dream. But then, you know, there were some circumstances that I won't dive into details about. But it was, uh, you know, it was interesting because it's like, wow, that, that really is true. That's something that has happened to me. And now it's validated. And, you know, it, it kind of, for some reason gave a validity to me feeling like I was a trollop and I wasn't enough and that God would never love me. And I was like, wow, that's so unfair. I didn't have a chance. So it was tough. It, it, it sounds it, it sounds it, but I, I want to, 
go back. I want to go back to the the, the missing USA bag. So you win it. You, you're doing all this crazy stuff. Now, at some point, there was a, there was a positive test, right? Because that's what sort of led up yeah, to. Yeah, I really the, pissed off Miss Team USA, and uh, we were all out partying the night before. And she told me she was going to tell our boss everything she knew about me, and I thought she was bluffing. She was nuts. <laughs> okay. And uh, I went in and had a dirty pee test, and you know, I I, I I have a story behind it. I'm putting it in my book, but um, I don't want to give you too much. But I, I just knew it, like the jig was up, right? Like I I knew that uh, I was about to face Tara, like the true Tara, and I, but I didn't realize that it was going to be on the scale that it did. I mean, the next day I turned on the radio and it says Miss USA is going to run just for cocaine, and then. You know, by the end of the night, I'm on every major news station. I'm on the front page of all of the newspapers. They're calling me Mess USA. They are, you know, The, the Apprentice was on. So they were like, is she going to get fired? Like, there was a lot of stuff. And so uh, there wasn't any hiding anything. I mean, all the only thing they knew for sure was that I failed a drug test. But, you know, uh, things were out there saying that I was promiscuous. And I was, like, dancing on tables. And, like, I was never that kind of drunk. Like, I felt very highly of myself when I was drinking. I was one of those people that would like dance in the VIP booth and like have my drink, but I was too cool to like be out of control. Like I, I wasn't, I wasn't a sloppy drinker or user. I was pretty good at it. I mean, so, I had my moments. So did you feel, you know, when they, when they, when you failed the pizzas, did you, I mean, how'd you feel about that? Cause I mean, some people would be like, well, you know, at the time, or maybe it was a sense of relief. Cause you figured, you know what? I don't have to hide this thing anymore. Cause now they all know. Yeah. It was a, it was a double-edged sword. I remember being mortified because, you know, when I was a kid, I, and I, I was in high school, like I did all of these things to try to prove people wrong, right? Like I will show you that I'm a good person. Like I'm worthy and blah, 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 blah. And there was always people, you know, starting rumors. And, but the thing is, is behind every rumor, there's a little bit of truth. And so I was just mad that people were writing the narrative of my life. I just wasn't ready to see that it was my actions that were causing them to create that narrative. And, you know, for the first time, like I really had to look at myself and I, I didn't have any fight left in me. I was just like, you know what? Yes. I, there's going to be cocaine in there, alcohol, maybe some weed. I don't know. I'm not a big pot smoker. Like I just kind of came out and told the Miss Universe organization everything. And, but there was, my mom thought I was going to kill myself because there was such a sense of peace that came with, Oh yeah, this is who I am. This you is don't have to hide it anymore. You, huh? didn't have to, you didn't have to hide it anymore. No, I didn't have to hide it, and uh, and I didn't have to pretend, and I didn't have to prove. I could just be the girl who had, was a drug addict with a problem. It was great. It was great to be able to just be the girl who's a drug addict who needs to go to rehab. So, 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 when did you have the conversation with Donald Trump? I mean, we, you know, the press conference is, you know, it's on YouTube. You can watch that. But I mean, at some point, you had a private. You must have sat down and had a private conversation with him. Well, he, I had to go to, uh, I had to go out and get out of New York and go stay with my mom in Columbus, Ohio, because she, uh, the press were at my hometown. Like they were bringing my grandmother a poinsettia for, for a statement. And, you know, my grandmother found out about that mess from a reporter before she found out from me because it was on the news. I didn't, you know, I mean, imagine she thought that I had died and that they were coming to get a quote about it. I mean, that's heavy. And they had, I mean, it, they were just everywhere. So I couldn't be in my town because it's very small and it's very easy to find people there. <laughs> and so I went up to Columbus, Ohio to stay with my aunt and my cousin. And uh, I was there for about a week and I turned 21 during that week and I didn't drink. Um, I don't, I don't know why I didn't drink. I wasn't trying to put myself on some type of a, uh, like cross to show people that yes I'm not gonna do this anymore it was more of like I got to sleep and not put on makeup for a few days and and rest and I had this peace I just knew that everything was gonna be okay I don't know why I, I mean I do now I think it's definitely this this very divine situation that happened because it took that it took me being humiliated in front of the entire nation and worldwide and for me to see okay maybe there's something wrong here um but when i got out of treatment that's when i became an advocate because 
I was treated like a trollin. Like I was treated like this terrible role model who, you know, let everyone down. And the truth was, was I was a, I was a very sick, sick girl. And I was being shamed on national television for having an illness. So, uh, and, it, uh, and that's when I started getting mad. All right. So let's back up a second. Tell, tell me, I want you to, can you tell us about, I mean, tell us about the conversation you had with Donald Trump, because I know that, I mean, he, he went oh. up and he did the press conference. He said, I'm going to give her a second chance. But what was it like just one-on-one -on -one with him? Um, well, he called me on the phone and ripped me in a asshole a couple of times. Uh, like, what did you do? What am I supposed to do? Blah, 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 blah. I'm so disappointed. And I was like, yes, sir, I understand. Well, and I just kind of just like, you know, tucked my tail between my legs. And then I went to New York because there was going to be a press conference and they were going to decide my fate, you know, and, um, and I went up to his office and he was like, what am I supposed to do here? Look at the mess. Like, look at all these people that are here, which of course we loved it. But I was <laughs> like, you know, I, I just played what I, the only card that I knew, I was like, look, I think that it would say far more about the organization and you, if you gave me a second chance and let me turn this around. Good for and, you. Uh, yeah, he really likes that idea. And uh, so, you know, he goes down there and Trump gives Tara a second chance, but it's Tara. Um, but that, that was about it. But, you know, for a couple of years after that, we did charity work together. We would stay in touch. He would call me his little star. Like, he was very good to me um, during, during that time. I think I pissed him off at some point. I don't know if it was, like, anything that I necessarily said or did, but I don't. I don't know when I got on his crap list. I think I'm still on his crap list. What are you going to do? Oh, what are you going to do? Go <laughs> what are you going to do when you get on the president's crap list? No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ain't nobody with a black, you know, with a balaclava coming into my room. So I think I'm okay. You're okay. I don't see any, like, I don't think anybody's tapping yeah, into the, the We're good. Do you I think nobody FBI is watching us? Although they're busy with this on Rush thing. So I doubt they're watching us. They don't have the time. Well, I hope someone's watching us because there's a lot of good that can come out of these. Uh, we're gonna, yes, and they do, and that's why I, I love doing these shows. So, so you yeah. go on recovery. So, what what is what's life like? If you get done with recovery, so tell me now what's what's life like for you today? Um, well, you yeah. Know, what are you doing with your time? Because I know, I know. That, I mean, I, I know you know, I moved out to Los Angeles immediately after I crowned the next Miss USA and I booked my first show on MTV, like my first audition, I booked it and I thought it was always going to be that way. It's not, don't get me ideas. Um, and then, you know, money started growing on trees and I had to grow up. Like I grew up in sobriety. I, I got sober when I was 20 and I lived on my own and I came to Los Angeles with like five grand and a dream and two suitcases. And somehow I managed to make a life out here. And, uh, and I had a couple of successful shows and then people would ask me to start speaking to tell my story. And, you know, being the good recovery girl that I was, I was like, I'm being a service, but I also was, you know, like a puppet. Everyone wanted to hear about the bad stuff and they never got to hear about the greatness of recovery. And, and that got, uh, that got frustrating. I mean, you know, I've been broke in sobriety. I've been sick in sobriety. I've been homeless in sobriety. I've had my heart broken in sobriety. I've broken hearts in sobriety. Like, you name it, life still happens. But the difference was that I actually had a foundation that I, that I gained by having the opportunity to go to treatment and meeting the right people to get me into the right 12 step How, how long were you in treatment for? Just for like 30 days. I wanted to stay. I was like, I want to stay for like six months. And they thought I should because I was very sick. Um, they didn't think I had a chance because the second I got out of rehab, I did Larry King, a media tour, telling the world, like, confessing my sins. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. So the first few years of my recovery was I was still very much in that mode of trying to prove to people that I wasn't the piece of crap that they thought I was. But then as time went on, um, you know, I, I had to learn. I had to learn life lessons that things aren't always going to go my way. And, and I, I don't know what's best for me a lot of the times. And I can't um, act like everything's okay when things aren't. You know, when I was eight years sober, I was suicidal because I, I um, again, I was seeking. But I needed a little extra help. And I 
you know, I ended up getting a new sponsor and, you know, he suggested that I go get an assessment. And then I found out that I've had severe depression my entire life and a panic disorder and, you know, and I'm extremely um, ADD. And so it's, I was finally put on medication that worked. And I remember I was scared to take it, you know, because I'm so sober. But um, I told my mom, I was like, mom, if I take this pill and I feel better, I'm going to be so mad that I let myself suffer for that long. And I was suffering and didn't know it. And I think a lot of people are going through that. They're suffering and, and beating themselves up because they feel like they shouldn't feel that way. And so what I learned was that I can't save my face and my ass at the same time. And I had to really get honest about who I was, what I was doing, and figure out where I lacked a lot of power. And I realized I lacked power every, every area of my life. Um, so I started, you know, working on my recovery harder and taking care of my mental illness. So Life's amazing. I have a garden. Uh, yeah, well... Uh Yes, you're a, you're a gardener. The last was, you know, my grandfather was a gardener. He had a little tiny garden, but he used to make fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. My make... grandfather. And he had a compost heap too. He had a what? He had a compost heap. So you know, so you take like the old vegetables and and mm -hmm. food, and you put it in a big pile, and it breaks down, and then you can mm -hmm. sprinkle it on the other soil because it's full of nutrients. See, Mother yeah, Nature's really so. smart. Mother Nature said, "Don't throw that shit away. It'll break down, and then you can use it again." Right. Because we just chuck yeah. everything in a great big pile and just wonder why, you know, our planet's going to shit. But that's a different story. But yes, yeah, my so grandfather my, was a gardener. My grandfather had the biggest garden in town, and he was on the front page of the paper for it. And his name was Johnny Connor. Had the best garden around. <laughs> my grandfather had an apple tree, and when I was a kid, I used to he used to get on the ladder because I couldn't reach the apples, and I reach up and I pluck them down, and he would make wine. Oh he'd wow! Make wine. He made yes. wine. Yes. Yeah, he did. It was just really, really sweet, and so. <laughs> And so, so you know, you know, when the Jewish holidays came around, I'd get a little, you know, as we like to say, oh. a little shickered up on the on my grandfather's wine. Oh, all right, there it is. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, I, I have to be honest, like the first little while of my sobriety, uh, I stayed sober just because I was afraid to let people down or look bad. And then I realized that I had kind of been running the show and I needed to do something different because I was dying in sobriety. And, People believe that you get sober and everything's fine, but I was, work at it. Yeah, I was still making the same mistakes that I did when I was using and beating myself up for it because I was like, I'm sober now. I should not be doing the things that I'm doing and like lying and cheating and doing stuff like that. And then it took me a long time to be able to admit that I can't do better than this. I was, uh, with my own devices, I'm ill-equipped for life and I need help. And so when it got unbearable at eight and a half years, I just threw myself into recovery and I've been doing it ever since. But thank God for that experience because, uh, you know, you have to really go through a lot of pain to appreciate what peace actually is. And when I found freedom and just being able to say, yeah, I went through that and I've done those things and I've done this, that, and the other, like I'm, I'm an open book because there's freedom behind that. Like, I don't have to prove anything to anyone. I don't have to look good for anyone. I can get a tattoo or cut my hair, pierce my nose. My mom hates it, but I can just be who I am. And I, I do a lot of good work. I help a lot of people and I have a great garden. I have three dogs that I absolutely adore. I have a fiance that would do anything for me and I would do. Yeah, I did see that you're getting married. Mazel tov, as we like to say, when is that happening? I don't know. We're probably just going to, uh, listen, I'm basic in the sense of I've never wanted a big wedding. So I, we, yes, I can tell you from out. experience, a big wedding does not a happy marriage make. No, listen, I, <laughs> I wore the white dress. I won Miss USA wearing a white dress. I don't need to fix up and have the best day of my life. I mean, honestly, the best day of my life just looks like sitting down in my living room, maybe watching desperate housewives sitting with my dogs, listening to the air conditioner, seeing the, I can just, I can be present. I can be there for the people in my life. And it's not all about me anymore. And thank God. Wow. How, and it's great. Like, I love recovery's it. amazing. How, so how long have you been in recovery now? I've been sober for 11 years, six months, and almost 11 years and seven months. And what, so what's the date? The date? December 11th of 2006. All right. I think that's great. And congratulations. And, you know, one other thing I wanted to tell you, you know, when I looked, 
when I looked at the um, the video of the press conference with Donald Trump and I and I I saw you apologize, I said to myself, you know, I don't think she should have apologized because I don't think she owes anybody an apology. And we we spend, I, you know, some of my closest friends, you know, are people in the treatment industry, and I meet a, a lot of amazing men and lots and lots of women in the treatment industry, and they're all amazing, powerful just forces in the universe. And I just said, you know, I really, it, it's, I'm so humbled when I meet, you know, when I get close to these people. And honestly, I don't think you owe anybody shit. Excuse my French. And you no. definitely don't owe them an apology. No, I don't. Not even to Donald Trump. You know, listen, I made amends to the people that I owed amends to. I've cleaned yeah. up my path for the things, but I'm not going to apologize for having an addiction. I didn't choose to be an addict at 14 years old. So and, I and nobody think does. And I appreciate you saying that. No one does. Yeah, no one, no one chooses mental illness or addiction. Uh, no one makes that choice. It's not, it's no fun. <laughs> and there's, uh, there's so many people out there that suffered just the way that I did. And I know that the reason why my little press conference and my apology tour pissed me off so much was because I knew that there was a kid out there that was watching me be shamed for not being a good role model because I was drinking and using because all they do is sensationalize. They sensationalize everything. Like Demi Lovato just had an OD. So they immediately yep. think it's heroin and it's, she's just sick. You know, it's like people get shocked when people relapse, but they don't get shocked when someone's cancer comes back. We really need to change the view of addiction in this nation. And we really need to start treating it with the empathy and compassion that it deserves because it's going to take us out. There are so many people dying from this every day and people being locked up and, and incarcerated. And it's, uh, it's really frustrating to watch. And, and you know, I know you and I talked off before we went live about how the criminal justice system is just full of people who have addiction and mental illness. And yeah, I, really have I, should have been locked up. I just didn't get caught that way. You know, I, I um, like cigarettes in jail. You know, we, we have we have the, what they call the sud talks down here. So you have substance abuse talks, as opposed to kind yeah. of like the TED talks. And I and uh, two years ago, I had a chance to to see Heather Hayes, and I don't know if you who, if you know who she is. She's a fantastic interventionist, very inspirational lady. She's based in Atlanta, and she gave one of the most amazing presentations. And what she said was, and I'll never forget it, was that you know we hear about all these existential threats like Al Qaeda and ISIS, and and you know uh, I don't know the melting ice caps, and we worry about all this stuff. The real threat is right here at home with this opioid crisis. We last year, and I know you probably know these statistics, but I do. We lost sixty-five thousand people. That's the size of an average crowd every Sunday at an NFL game. And every year, we lose those people in Palm Beach County. Yeah. Last year, we lost the equivalent of two seven four sevens, over yeah. six hundred people, it, just in one county here. Right. I mean, listen, it's this epidemic didn't just start this has been happening since i was 14 years old it just got worse you know heroin became so big because pharmaceuticals started cutting down a little bit on access to you know percocet and oxys and morphine and fentanyl and now it's like well if i can't afford that i can go get the cheap stuff on the street and get a better high so these kids are like taking these things that their body can't handle. They don't know what's in it, but they're kids. They don't care. And most of addiction starts in adolescence. And so, you know, we're, we're looking at these people who are homeless on the street and being like, well, they chose that life. And it's like, well, no, because their addiction started when they were a kid. They were a kid. That's a little kid sitting on the side of the road, nodding out, hungry, cold, without, one of, without his left shoe. <laughs> And uh, I think that we're just such a judgmental, shame, you know, influenced society that we need to start loving each other and treating everyone with the compassion and respect that they deserve. Do you think there'll come a point in time where we'll have treatment available for everybody? Because I know in my practice, you know, the, the very difficult conversation I have with people is, do you have insurance? Do you have the ability to pay? Because if they're asking me to go to court and get a court order, it's just, at the end of the day, it's just a piece of paper if I don't have somewhere to send them. Right. Well, it's frustrating. It's like making a Schindler's List. I mean, my, my boss, Greg Hanley, I work with him at uh, Soba. He owns a treatment center and, you know, he said he referred to it as making a Schindler's List because you know that half of those people are going to die. Statistically, yeah. one out of three of them are going to die. And 
the insurance companies aren't being held accountable to the Parity Act. And, you know, now it's getting even harder for people to um, get access to the right treatment. I mean, and there's another big thing that's happening in the treatment industry where people are basically selling off an insured patient to the highest bidder. It's like yeah. human trafficking. We've so had a lot of that down here. Yeah. And, you know, here's the thing, like in the healthcare industry alone, like people aren't getting their needs met when it comes to doctor visit, uh, mental illness, even physical ailments. Like a lot of people can't afford insurance. So do I think that there will be treatment available for all? I don't think so. I hope so. But I also hope that everyone has access to healthcare and that can, you know, get something taken care of without being afraid of losing their home. Um, so we've got a long way to go, but I think that we've got enough players out there and hard heads that are willing to put, put their, their life into creating a better space for the people that came before them. And I, I consider myself one of them. I'm hoping so. So before, I, before we sort of sign off, I want to, what does the future hold for you? Cause you sort of hinted at a book. Is there a movie coming? And if so, who's playing you? Oh my God. Um, what's the name of the actress I, who was in that movie, the Wolf of Wall Street? She played his wife. Oh, Margot Robbie? Maybe. Margot Robbie, I mean, no? I don't think I'm that interesting. I, I, I would like to think I could be, but I'm not. Um, I'm writing a book, basically just like an anecdotal situation. I've been working on it for a while. And, you know, when I turned 10 years sober, I really felt like I, I finally fell into my skin. So, you know, I've been writing since I've been sober, but I don't feel like I was sane for most of it and I didn't have the power to do it so now I uh, I do I'm going to tell a lot of stories and you know try to take the shame away from normal things that people go through in life and, and get I, I hope that by revealing all of my shame that I had it can strip away the shame that other people have felt so that they can just be who they are and be loved that's great so before we sign off, um, how do people follow you? I know you have you have Instagram. Do you tweet? Do you do Facebook? Um, I have the Instagram page. It's Tara E. Connor because somebody stole Tara Connor. <laughs> and um, I think uh, I won the Twitter war. So it's Tara Connor on Twitter. And then I have a, a public uh, Facebook page. Okay. And send messages. Like if anyone's struggling, needs help, I answer people all the time. I'm not too cute to answer an email. I love it. All right. So I'm going to give out my information and Tara, don't go in here because I want to run something by you before you leave. So if anybody okay. wants to get a hold of us or they want to, they're probably going to want to get a hold of me just to get a hold of you. I, I'm probably not going to get so many calls now because of you. But if you want to get a hold of me just to get a hold of Tara, you can reach us on the web at drugandalcoholattorneys.com. You can also oh, email. Oh, people can go to my website too, yeah. taracana.com. Taracana.com. Okay. All right. Taracana.com. So, and they can email me, even if they just want to get Tara's uh, website address again, at mark, M-A-R-K, at drugandalcoholattorneys.com, or they can call us at 561-419-6095. Tara, I thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. So, it was nice chatting. It was great. So, hold on a second, and I'm going to log off, and then I want to run some by you, okay? Thank you, everybody. Next week, fr uh, I think next week we're Friday at 5, because I've got a... I've got a conflict. You know, this legal thing sometimes gets in the way of a Facebook live show. I hate when that happens. Anyway, hold on a second, Tara.